Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, Welcome, everyone. Um, it's nice to see some people joining live, and uh, we are recording this session. So um, for people that can't join us um, or want to to watch it again, then you can. We'll make the recording available on the the GPR Max website. This is a a session um, to help support our. Um, our entry into Google Summer of Code this year, which we're we're very excited about to be be part of the program once again. And um, what we found in the past is that it's it's really useful to have a kind of information session um, such as this right at the start, because um, as well as kind of introducing people a little bit more to GPR Max and um, introducing ourselves, which we'll we'll do in a minute. Um, it's also an opportunity to to talk a bit more about the projects that we've listed and even to talk about projects that, that you might want to propose um, yourselves, which is possible too. Um, so I probably should have introduced myself. My name's Craig. I'm one of the lead developers of GPR Max, and I'm also uh, an assistant professor of civil engineering at Northumbria University um, in the UK. Um, so. We'll do some introductions. I'll um, I'll pass over to um, the other two mentors that are here this morning, um, starting with Antonis and then Heracles. So Antonis, over to you. Oh, uh, hi guys, can you hear me? Uh, apologies if you cannot see me. I mean, my, I have some problems with my huge amounts of gadgets that I have in my desk. Uh, my name is Antonis Yanopoulos. I'm uh, I'm by a mile the older of everybody in here. Uh, I'm a professor of applied geophysics and computational dynamics at the University of Edinburgh. And uh, I will be working on radar modeling for a very long time. And uh, it started GPR Max many, many years ago in a very different form than it's now. So I have a great interest to see GPR Max grow and uh, do a lot uh, better in more communities than actually our radar community. Thanks, Antonis. Um, Heracle, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello, everyone. My name is Rakim. I'm a lecturer in my still learning geophysics from the University and I'm part of the team behind GPR Max. I work primarily on downstream trade with applications in machine learning, numerical modeling, and every aspect. Thanks, Eric. Your your microphone was a, a bit quiet. I don't know if you can able to make it a bit louder or not. Um, ah. uh, I think I have to argue in, in a second. Uh, we'll let you we'll let you now? do that whilst try again yeah is it better now yeah that sounds a bit better yeah yeah how about now yeah that's okay. good yeah i was using the microphone of the of the headphones yeah so i'm miraculous i'm a lecturer in machine learning and geophysics from university of aberdeen and i'm part of the team behind gpr max i work primarily on ground penetrating radar and almost in every aspect of it, from numerical modeling to signal processing interpretation and some applications of machine learning. Thanks, Heracle. Um, So maybe, you know, I'll say a little bit about GPR Max um, and, um, and Antonis and, and Heracle can, can chip in as, as well, and then we'll sort of move on to talking about the, the projects themselves. I guess you, you may already have seen GPR Max is listed in the science um, and medicine category of Google Summer of Code. So it is very much a, a scientific piece of software. Um, it's been around in, in different forms now for, um, where are we? Since 2000, oh, since 97, Antonis, is that right? Something like that. I kind of lose track now. Yes, yeah, 1997, the first thing. So it's much older than most of the of the contestants here. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's it's quite a mature piece of software. Um, we it, it it's used primarily to stimulate electromagnetic wave propagation, um, and it's mostly its features are mostly geared towards simulating ground penetrating radar. Hence the the GPR in the GPR Max name. So most of our users and our, our community come from um, or are associated with um, using 
ground penetrating radar um, and have a a need or a desire to to simulate GPR and, and that's that's primarily um, you know how people use GPR Max, but it is a, a general electromagnetic wave um, simulation software. So we do have people using it in in other um, communities as well, um, in sort of biomedicine, um, in some remote sensing and um, planetary science radar applications too. So. Um, it's not just used for, for GPR. Um, I guess, hopefully, you know, you've had a chance to maybe dig through some of our, um, our code on, on GitHub. And um, you'll also see that we have quite an extensive um, documentation set as well, which um, is hosted on, on Read the Docs. So it's, it's definitely worth, you know, having a look through the code, trying to familiarize yourself with um, how it works at a, a kind of basic level. Um, what you'll see is that the code is, is written in Python um, primarily, but there are parts of the code where we need um, a bit more performance. So the, the numerical solver engine um, that is that uses a, a package called Scython, which some of you, you may be familiar with. That essentially allows us to continue to write code that looks quite a lot like Python, um, but we specify types and then that code can be compiled to C um, and it enables us to, you know, to get a lot more speed for the, the numerical solver part of the, the software. Um, and that uses, that takes advantage of things like um, OpenMP um, on CPU um, to give us some um, parallel speed up. And you'll also notice perhaps that we, um, GPR Max can run on GPU as well. So that is the, again, that's the solver part of the software um, that has been also written um, in CUDA on NVIDIA CUDA, so that allows us to, to execute simulations on GPU, which is, has provided a really, really useful speed up. So up to 30 times faster than a, um, a multi-core CPU simulation. So we've seen a lot of advances um, that have come through the, the speed in which we can now run simulations on, on GPU, which is nice. Um, so there are there are various different languages i guess in addition to the uh in addition to python that are used in gpr max um, and as we'll get on to later you'll see some of the projects relate to uh things like cuda openmp and, and and stuff like that so those are technologies obviously that if you are interested in in those specific projects you know then you should you know you should hopefully have some previous understanding or, or familiarity of um, to kind of help you with those uh, those things. So as I said, GPR Max is principally written in Python. Um, the way in which you, you build a model or a simulation can be done in a couple of different ways um, for kind of at a, at a basic level and for, for, for users that maybe don't have a lot of computing experience uh, you can write uh, a text-based input file um, using uh, a series of what we call hash commands. So commands that, that begin with a hash symbol. And that's quite a simple way of, of constructing a, a simulation. You can specify these hash commands to define uh, materials and objects um, and geometry that you want to, to simulate. Um, and, and that input file is then used um, within GPR Max to, to build an electromagnetic model um, and then um, then simulate that model. So that's that's kind of a, at a basic level um, how you define a, a model or simulation in GPR Max. More recently, um, we have created a, a Python API for GPR Max um, for people that you know like yourselves that are have a background in computing. Um, or want to do more advanced um, advanced things with the, the model. So um, in that case, you know, you can basically just write a Python script um, and interact with the API um, and build your your simulation or model that way. Um, and it looks quite a lot like the 
um, the text-based input file method, um, but it's using um, Python commands and functions directly, uh, which is a lot more flexible, um, means we can do a lot more you know, advanced things with our models. Um, so you will, you will see that as well um, in the code. Um, one thing to mention um, is that on GitHub, we have two, there are two main branches to GPR Max. There's a master branch um, and a, a developer or devel branch. Now, we're kind of at a point um, with our development at the moment where we're about to make the developer branch the new master branch. Um, it contains a lot of um, new features, such as the, the API I just mentioned, and um, lots of other useful features for, for modeling GPR as well. So for Google Summer of Code, um, any of the projects that you work on um, should use the developer branch. Um, so actually, if you're kind of familiarizing yourself with GPR Max, it's worth, uh, it's worth doing that um, using the developer branch um, rather than the master branch. Um, there are not a massive amount of, of differences between the two, but there are enough that it's, as I say, that it's, it's worth using the developer branch because that's what we will all be using um, moving forward. There's, there's a lot more, I guess, we could say about GPR Max. I don't know if you want to, to add some more thoughts and comments at the moment, um, Antonis. Uh, no, I think you covered everything, Craig. Uh, and I was battling with this bloody camera with some manuscript to work now. So that's a, a lesson learned. So, you know, I think we're good. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, as I kind of suggested in, in, in some of the emails that, that we sent out, it, it's worth sort of, you know, spending a little bit of time with the documentation, installing GPR Max, trying some of our, our kind of simple example models. Um, you know, we don't expect, we recognize that, you know, not everyone that comes to Google Summer of Code um, has a background in, in physics or electromagnetics. And, and that's not, you know, that's not what this is about. Um, this is, a, you know, it's about computing projects. Um, however, it's, you know, it's useful if you, if you have at least a high level um, kind of understanding about you know, what the software is trying to do and the, the main kind of principles and, and techniques that it uses. And a lot of that is described, you know, um, in the documentation. Obviously, you know, you're, if you want to go further um, and, and learn more, you're welcome to do that. There's, there's lots of links to publications on our website that um, will give you more information about different parts of the, the software, the different techniques that it uses and, and, and how that um, how that all works. But there's no, you know, the, there's no need to go that deeply for most of the projects that we um, that we're proposing. Um, so don't worry too much, you know, if you if you don't have that um, understanding right now. Um, OK, so. I guess maybe it's worth sharing the if I share my screen with the the list of projects that we've we've published at the moment then we can we can kind of have a chat um, about uh, a little bit more detail about you know what those might entail um, so let me just share my screen um, ah I think you need to enable um, screen sharing for me Antonis or or you can share it if you want and you're muted as well <laughs> Yeah, so I think I think I've done it. Okay, right. Let me try again. Uh, yeah, use the window. Okay, hopefully, um, you can see the uh, the project list. So. Um, I guess we forgot to say actually there are there are four mentors um, in total um, that are um, taking part in and supporting Summer of Code with GPR Max. Um, Dr. Rania Patsia can't be with us today, but um, she will. Um, she is a 
um, well, she works at the University of Edinburgh at the moment um, with Antonis, and um, she will probably be supporting on on some of these projects as as well. Um, so there are there are four of us um, in total. We 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 work very much together as a team. Um, so we you know we we will all kind of you probably have a primary mentor for your project, but um, all of us will be involved to to some degree um, in in supporting um, all of the projects. Um, so I don't know, Heracle, do, do you want to to talk a bit about the the first one? You muted. Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 go. Okay, so my internet is not so stable. So for the first one, I mean, we want to, to capitalize on all of this uh, popularity that nowadays the chatbots have, and also the availability of them. It's relatively simple to tune some open source LLM in order to become either a chatbot for GPR Max or to use it to automatically generate some input files for GPR Max. So the whole idea is to create a framework to get some files based on some simple commands. And then we can use some open source LLM in order to rephrase this command, in order to teach an LLM to generate an input file based on any type of uh, command the user would give. So I don't, I, it's, it sounds very complicated, but I think with the tools that we have nowadays is not so much and it is quite doable. And this is, regarding to creating an automatic generator of input files. But for a chatbot, we can use all the discussions that we have from our Google forum, which are quite a lot nowadays. I think uh, the, the Google forum exists for the last eight years, I think. And there are a lot of responses there. So we can use all that to tune an existing open source LLM in order to have an automatic response to, to the GPR Max users. Um, personally, I'm not so familiar with uh, LLMs. I'm familiar with machine learning, but not, but not so much with large language models. So it's going to be an educated, an educating process for us as well. Uh, but hopefully, if we get some good candidate, we will manage to, to get through this. I don't know, do you guys want to to add something on that? Not really. I think just to say that you know having a an AI chatbot will certainly be really helpful for for us because. Um, a lot of the questions that we get through our Google group at the moment, which is is sort of the main uh, the main place for people to ask general questions about GPR Max, there are a lot of um, similar questions that keep coming up. So having a kind of automated way of um, responding to them, I think, will you know will be really useful for for us and for GPR Max um, in general. Um, I see there's some questions yeah, in the chat, which Antonis has responded to, I think. And es Islam up. has a hand up. Do you want to ask something? Please go ahead. Uh, yes, I want to ask uh, some questions about first idea. Hello, everyone. First, uh, what is uh, the functionality? Uh, the chatbot uh, will be processed or, or just uh, uh, speaking with user and answer uh, same questions? Yeah, the, as I said, it's going to have two elements, the chatbot will be just answering questions. So it's going to be fine-tuned using the Google Forum, and maybe we can add some further questions and answers manually. And also, it would be great if we can scrap off all the manual from GPR Max website and feed it as well as it is. So the ideal outcome of this would be a chatbot that would be literate in GPR Max, know how to answer questions regarding GPR Max. Which I'm quite optimistic that that this can happen, because it it already like ChatGPT already gave some relatively good answers regarding GPR Max, but obviously mm. needs some some fine tuning. So the second aspect yeah. is to use a, an LLM to generate input files. I mean, if you check GPR Max, how GPR Max works, you want to model something and you put your commands into an input file. So this is one of the two ways that you can you can run GPR Max. So we're hoping to to make it a little bit more easy for the user just to describe the model. So I want a model to be, I don't know, half a meter by half a meter by half a meter. I want to have a receiver there, a transmitter there. I want to have a stochastic meter just to speak it out. And then an LLM to generate the input file automatically. 
So I think that this is going to be a little bit more challenging, but I think there are some ways to, to do that because in the first case, we do have the data to tune the LLM from the Google forum. And also we can use the manual as well to, to, to further fine tune it. But in the second case, we need a lot of examples, a lot of descriptions of input files in order for the LLM to find the causal relationship between those two. But there is a way to automatically generate some of them. And then I was hoping that if, if we can use some open source LLM, for example, I can have a script that can generate some specific input files with specific dimensions, and I can change these dimensions, and at the same time, automatically generate the label of this. So the, the description of this, and then we can use some open source LLM to rewrite this description in order to further augment the data, in order to at the end to fine tune any LLM that we will decide to use for any type of description. So any type of description, any type you're gonna write this description, even if you have some typos, even if you don't know English, or if you can write the LLM is and start to generate the input file. I mean, if we do that, that would be super helpful because it will, uh, I mean, GPR Max is, is user friendly to use. I mean, if you, mm -hmm. if you check the manual, uh, it is user friendly, but this is gonna make it even more user friendly. And uh, yeah, I think, I think it's, gonna, it's gonna be very, very good. Okay, thank you for uh, your uh, Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, just to add a sort of more general, um, a more general point as well. You know, these project descriptions are are kind of our initial ideas. Um, it doesn't mean that exactly what is written here is you know exactly what has to be done for the the projects. The, you know, if if you are selected and um you know you you choose one of these projects then there will be some scope to kind of um you know direct the project a little bit um based on what you want to do and and what your specific skills that align with the project are so you know there as i say there's there's definitely um you know some scope to kind of develop these project descriptions um in slightly different directions depending on the uh you know your skill set um and 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 you know and how the kind of project evolves over the the weeks that we uh that we work through um okay so uh let's maybe move on to um project number 2 um project number 2 um is going to need going to require somebody um who who knows a little bit about um, Apple's Metal um, framework? Now, the reason that we've proposed um, a, an Apple Metal port um, of GPR Max is that, as I mentioned earlier, what we've seen from our um, our work developing the the numerical engine in GPR Max to run on GPU is that there are significant speed ups. Um, that have been that we've achieved. So, as it says here, we we've primarily used CUDA, um, which has given us you know speed ups up to thirty times um, faster than our our CPU our multi threaded CPU version. Um, we also have a an, an OpenCL solver um, in the developer branch as well, which has has shown some some interesting speed ups too. But we do have a lot of users who are using um, Apple hardware, um, and we really think that there are you know some significant performance benefits if we had uh, an Apple Metal port of the of the numerical engine. So that's what this project is about. Um, as I said before, the the kind of well, let me take a step back. GPR Max is kind of you could think of it as divided into sort of two significant phases within the code. There's a kind of what we call a building phase where um, the input file that you define or the the Python API that you use, um, all of that information is used to basically build the electromagnetic model. 
Um, and that's all done, all written in Python. Um, and that happens on, on CPU. Um, and that's the sort of building phase. There is then the, the solving phase, which takes that um, electromagnetic model, um, which is actually a, um, basically a, a grid of what we call Yi cells with information about um, electromagnetic material properties. And it bas bas basically iterates on that grid um, and solves the models. And that's what we call the solving phase. And it's that solver that we have ported um, to different frameworks at the moment. So we have a, a Scython port, we have a CUDA port, um, and we have a, an OpenCL port. And it's that part that we want to now um, look at doing a, an Apple Metal port of. Um, Craig, there is a there is a question about if, if people will need a Mac or Apple products for that. I mean, I, I would suggest that possibly that that's without it. I think theoretically it would be very difficult to actually be doing something and then trying to test it. Well, uh, so I suspect that will be uh, possibly needed. And uh, uh, yeah, that that will make uh, I, I suppose the the possibility of people using taking that up a, a lot smaller. But I mean, we will put it up there because. Uh, uh, OpenCL or CL that actually was uh, the other option which already have and actually was running on Apple computers quite all right. Uh, obviously, Apple had departed from supporting OpenCL formally uh, anymore, so it's, they're not really they're using their own libraries and their own GPU uh, compute. Uh, and we thought that maybe actually try and, uh, uh, and, and see if we can have a port on Apple Metal uh, to help people who actually do use Max and say, yeah, I cannot really go as fast as other people can. Yeah, I mean, there's some interesting benchmarks um, around that sort of compare um, CUDA, OpenCL, and Metal, and and Metal often comes up quite favorably in terms of performance. So that was, you know, one of the reasons to um, to look at it as well. Um, I my, I mean, I I'm not super familiar with with Metal myself, but. It's it's basically C it's C based. Um, I don't think it you know if if you if you know C if you've done any CUDA, then I suspect doing a metal port would not be a particularly large step. Um, and actually, the way that we do the the CUDA and OpenCL at the moment, we use a kind of uh, templating approach. Um, so we try and um, uh, keep as many kind of common parts um, from a sort of single code base and then just template out the the sort of differences depending on whether it's CUDA or, or OpenCL. So we'd, we'd hope that we could do a metal port in a, a similar way. Um, but yes, I think, you know, definitely if you don't have Apple hardware, that will make this project um, pretty tricky to uh, to do, I think. So um, it's kind of a, a probably a prerequisite that you you have access to to some sort of um, Apple machine for that one. Um, projects three and four, uh, we can probably well, uh, well, maybe let's talk about them separately actually, because project number four again, um, you know, is to do with Apple hardware. So um, we'll we'll come to that. Um, project number three is really about um, tuning and optimizing the the solvers that we we already have at the moment. Um, so the the CUDA and, and OpenCL um, based solvers. Um, so it it's going to require people to you know to have some understanding of both these technologies um, and hopefully some experience of using some of the the benchmarking and profiling tools um that are that are out there so it's it's really about kind of digging into what are the current bottlenecks um of the the CUDA and, and OpenCL solvers that we currently have you know could we refactor some of our code to um you know to overcome those bottlenecks um it's you know as i say it's going to require tuning and optimization and kind of benchmarking what we we currently have in a uh 
a robust and kind of thorough way um, so that we know where those those limitations are. Um, as it says there, the, the way in which we, we implement CUDA and OpenCL um, are using the PI CUDA and PI OpenCL um, packages, uh, which obviously allow you to access those you know, frameworks via Python, um, which is, is really useful. Um, but you would need to have an understanding of those packages to kind of understand how we could, you know, tune our code to to squeeze some more performance out of it. Um, project number four is is similar in in as much as it's a an, an optimization um, and tuning based project. Um, so again, you know, it's going to require benchmarking and and profiling. Um, but this time it's it's about our how our open MP solver, so the CPU solver, um, performs on on Apple hardware. Um, so we we already mentioned an Apple Metal port, but at the moment you know you can run GPR Max um, on on Apple hardware, um, and it can take advantage of of multi threading using Open MP on on CPU. But we're interested to see if we can, you know, if we can get some more um, performance um, out of, of, of that, um, specifically on Apple's new, um, their own silicon. So in the past, obviously, Apple used Intel-based chips. Um, and, you know, there, there are lots of kind of tuning and optimization has been done on Intel-based CPUs. Um, however, we really haven't done anything or, or any work to investigate how we could perhaps better optimize our OpenMP code to run on, on Apple Silicon. So this project, similarly to project two, um, would obviously require um, somebody to have access to um, a machine, an Apple machine with the new um, Apple um, Silicon on it. And that would certainly well, I think that would be a prerequisite for this project. Otherwise, it would, you know, it would be quite difficult to um, to do. Uh, Craig, can I can I just make some comments on that as well? Obviously, yeah. that, that depends on the on the on the availability of Apple hardware, but also uh, Apple uh, again, uh, uh, they're they're using their own sync compilers on the LLVM and not really the GCC ones. And uh, and then, although we, there is way to use GCC and we do and a lot of people do and we do ourselves as well. Then the, uh, as um, LLVM I obtain OpenMP capability and there is a way to have it, then maybe using the native compiler on uh, on Apple then make uh, the user's life easier as well. We don't really need to have to put Homebrew on and have GCC on and all the other kind of stuff in order to be able to to compile. Uh, and finally, a very rogue comment in a, in a way, uh, uh, we are using Cython for a very long time. And the reason we use Cython is because we need the speed of C to actually do any uh, proper numerical computation in any good time. If we do that all in Python, even with NumPy and all these things, uh, the execution time will have been horrendous. So it's important to be able to run the key parts of the of the solving process uh, on actually C code in a way. So Cython does that for us. But over the years, there are possibly other frameworks that come up to speed up Python significantly for what we want. So if if there is a, a suggestion as well that say you know look if you convert your Cython parts to Roomba or something else that actually these days are a lot closer to C, a lot easier, a lot faster. Uh, I mean, uh, we'll be probably happy to see that as well. Uh, we're not wedded in Python for in Cython for any other reason. The fact that they can do OpenMP I uh, multi-threaded performance uh, on, um, on 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 converting the code to C. Uh, the code when it's converted to C is not really pretty to see. That's that's another problem. You cannot really hack into it. It's really automatically co uh, created code. It's never really easy to work with. Uh, but the performance is good. So that's another aspect that we might cost to consider as well. Yeah, thanks, Antonis. And I guess you know the the reason there are so many of these projects related to kind of performance and optimization is that. A lot of our users, you know, run very, very large computationally intensive models. So trying to squeeze out every bit of performance from the solver is, is really important because, you know, we have a lot of users that are academics or are working in research. 
And you know they might be running models on on high performance computing machines that can take days, weeks, even months to run. So optimizing the the speed at which we you know can can execute the solving part of GPR Max is is really really important, um, and you know can potentially have a significant impact on um, on these much larger uh, simulations. So yeah, number five again. We're, we're we're still sticking with the theme of performance and optimization. This is a a pretty. Um, I guess this this would really suit somebody who has a kind of understanding of of the sort of hardware side of things as well, um, because what we have have seen is that there are are certain strategies for um, how you implement the the solver um which so i should have said earlier that the gpr max solver is based on a, a numerical method called the finite difference time domain method um and there you know there as it says in the description here there have been um published work that looks at the way that you implement this um algorithm in terms of memory and cache access um on 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 hardware that can improve the the speed at which it, it runs. So this is probably a, a slightly more um, tricky project in terms of it's going to require some uh, a bit of reading of of some of this literature on um, on cache and memory optimization, and then really you know probably digging quite deeply into the um, into the code, maybe even modifying some of the automatically generated C code. Um, to see if we can, you know, further optimize the way in which we, you know, that we read um, values from memory and and from different um, different cache levels of the of the hardware. So yes, this is another another kind of performance than an optimization project. Um, and the final one on the list. Um, this is this kind of gets to what I what I mentioned earlier. So I said that GPR Max you could think about being divided into to two kind of main phases: uh, a model building phase uh, and an execution phase or a solving phase. Now at the moment, um, these two phases um, are are linked together, um, and the 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 execution phase happens obviously after the the building phase at the moment the the building phase as i said earlier mostly happens um on cpu well no sorry it it all happens on cpu um and most of it is um is serial there are some small parts of it that are have been paralyzed um, using openmp but most of it is serial um, and then once that model is built, um, then you can either execute it, solve it on CPU um, or GPU. Now, what would be great um, is if we could kind of find a way of decoupling these two phases. Um, so you could basically have a um, you could have a, a process that was was building models. Um, that was separate from an, a, another process that was the solving them or executing them, um, and that would be great because you, those two two operations could then run um, in parallel. Um, you could be building models at the same time as executing models that you know that you'd already built, um, and that would be a big a big improvement. We think um, now decoupling these two phases. Um, is certainly not going to be a, a super straightforward task. Um, it's going to require a bit of sort of um, code design in terms of you know how do we separate them, um, how do we save or store our built model somewhere such that the execution phase can um, can can read it and solve it and execute it. Um, so we've we rated this project difficulty as as hard um and given it the the sort of longest timeline that 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 Google allow but you know making some headway with this project would be would be really valuable for 
for us, for, for GPR Max users. So if you do have an interest in, in this project and you want to, you know, kind of discuss some potential strategies um, or, or more detail with us, then, um, you know, please um, feel free to, you know, to get in touch um, to do that. But yeah, there is a question in the form about, you know, whether building mean training. Mm -hmm. uh, the building here is basically creating all the parameters in the right places to actually uh, start the solving process. So, for example, you might want to have a metal box in space and have an antenna next to it to radiate a wave and see how the waves will do. So, in a way, you specify the coordinates of the box, the material, if it's metal or if it's something else, uh, and then where is the source, what kind of source it is, what kind of antenna it is, what pulses it will send, uh, how big is the box that you simulate, all this kind of information to, to design a model, a scenario, if you like, a scene, uh, and what you need to get out of the scene when you run the simulation, it, we call the building phase of the model. There is no solving there. So once you have that, then all the parameters are known in the in the numerical grid, if you like, in the space that you're simulating. Then the solver starts and starts from the beginning and solves the equations to predict and calculate what the fields will do. That's basically what Zipiramax does. So these buildings phase when you have complex materials, you might have soil that is inhomogeneous with very small variations of rocks and things. So uh, uh, changing a lot of aspects in a, in, a, in a model that can take quite some time uh, and can be quite uh, intricate in a way. I mean, we have models that, model, that simulate real antennas, models that uh, simulate anti-personnel landmines, for example, for, for trying to find a solution of detecting them with GPR. Uh, other people do models of uh, Mars for Perseverance, Rimfax radar. So th these models can be complex. So uh, we want to separate this building phase of preparing all the parameters uh, that you need before you, do, you start solving for the fields. That's kind of this the building phase in this uh, in this category. I guess I mean the, the other people may also be familiar, you know, with the term meshing. It's 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 a similar sort of of phase. You're basically you know taking information about the objects that you want to create and building a um, a grid or a mesh um, with that information. That's that's what we're trying to kind of do during the what we're calling the the build phase. So those are those are the six projects that we we have on our list. Um, as I said earlier, um, I think there's there's some scope if I if I remember the GSOC rules for you to propose your your own project um, as long as you discuss that with us. Um, and as I also said earlier, you know these these project descriptions are not um, set completely in stone. Uh, you know, there's some flexibility if you, when you're putting together your application, think, oh, it would be great to, you know, take this approach with this project or try this, then that's absolutely something that um, that we're open to. And, you know, we can kind of see from some of the comments in the chat that obviously, you know, people have thoughts and ideas about tools and approaches that, um, that might be useful. And, and that's great. You know, you should definitely um, describe those in your in your application. In terms of the the application itself, um, you've probably seen we we have a sort of um, outline template which describes the the sort of basic information that we're looking for um, in an application. So um, some of that is about your skills and background, your your motivation. Um, and then some of that information, obviously, is about the, the project that you're interested in, um, how you think you might approach it, um, you know, what you think the sort of key challenges and tasks are and, and how they may fit over the, the project timeline. So the more kind of um, information and, and detail you can provide in your project application um, that enables us to uh have a, an understanding of your background and skills and, and what you want to do then the i think the better you know that that will make your your application um in the in the long run um 
There is another question, Craig, at the very end, is the project six is multi-threading or multi-processing are the objective here. I, I think the objective is, in a way, in some cases, there are a lot of models that have to be generated uh, and uh, run. And uh, sometimes you can be generating models while we're running the models, but if the processes are coupled, you have to almost serially generate, run, generate, run, and cannot separate this process. So if you decouple the generation from the running, uh, you can actually uh, be more efficient in execution. On the other hand, if you can decouple completely the process of generating models to running, then you can then create different approaches to, you say, user interfaces, if you like, uh, to create models and transfer them to big machines that run the code without having to do anything else. Uh, so it be becomes a little bit more efficient that way, although for the user, it might be completely transparent. So uh, in a normal case, you know, you can just generate or run as normally do and the user wouldn't know any better. But in some cases, that can be really beneficial when you have to create 100 models, one after the other, uh, to run them. And you can actually get two pipelines of processing work, uh, one generating, the other running. Yeah, I mean, I don't think good. I think that you that person's happy now. I, I think you know that there is already sort of multi-threading, um, certainly in the in the solving phase and a little bit in the building phase. So we're not really looking to change those things at the moment. It's it's the decoupling that and the the dividing into to two pipelines, as Antonis described it, that I think is the the key to Project Six. I mean, to, to put it bluntly and very simply, this and if you can uh, cleverly, and that's actually one important aspect, the, save all the information that you that you need for running a model uh, in a good way, in efficient way, that it doesn't take half a terabyte or whatever, and then very cleverly, quickly, we can actually uh, read it back, set up the the the. the the matrices really that we use and then do the solving and store your, your, your results, then actually that's basically the crunch of this thing. But the devil is this is in the detail because these two, cap, these two processes uh, are not so intimately coupled because obviously you're solving after you have built, but still there are dependencies between one another on information on other things. So it's not as straightforward as I say it now, but, but the crux of it is this in a way. You have to store somehow some information so the solver can take it and do something with it. Uh, but uh, how efficiently, nice and quickly you can do this is what makes it good or bad. You know, if it takes a lot longer to write, to write and read the files, then you might as well leave it coupled. Yeah, because it's these, as we said before, these models can be massive. So um, it's not like you can just, you know, pickle it to file and then unpickle it again and, and everything will be fine. Um, it's it's got to be you know there has to be more efficient sort of clever ways of of doing that to deal with the the large amount of potential information. Um, I don't think I'm trying to. Th I don't think there was any other points that I was going to cover. I think maybe the only other thing to mention is, you know, whilst um. You know, whilst we're absolutely happy to sort of answer general questions that you might have when you're putting together your your proposal, obviously that you know that the volume of interest in in summer of code is such that you know we we can't help every individual person you know edit their and put together their their own proposal that you know that would just be um, not realistic. Um, so as I say, you know, general questions, if you, you have them, you know, to, to help you put together your proposal, that's fine. Um, but we can't really sort of review and, and, and edit individual proposals. Um, there's, there's just not kind of time to, um, to do that, unfortunately. Are there any other questions? Um, that anybody wants to put either into the chat or, or, you know, feel free to to put your hand up and, and you can ask them as well, if you like. I mean, I think you mentioned that as well, that, uh, I mean, most of the things you we work as a team, where it's kind of a small organization with or like an open source code for, for electromagnetics, primarily for research. I mean, there are lots of people in industry as well, which use the, the GPR Max for their own. 
uh, purposes and designing, which is absolutely fine and nice. But uh, so we try to work together as a, as a team. We have kind of weekly meetings uh, and trying to to help uh, with various aspects. I mean, uh, uh, the the main aspect of this thing is how we can make a a code that actually solves uh, interesting problems for research and development uh, in, in this kind of tool, but in electromagnetics. So we're not really coming from a purely computing background. We're not computing say, computer scientists ourselves in a way. Uh, so it's more about scientific computing, if you like, than actually formal uh, computing approach uh, that we take. Yeah, and I guess related to that, you know, some of you may have contacted orgs where the the mentors and, and or, org ad Means their sole job is, you know, working with that code and developing that code, and that's what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we are, you know, our, our day jobs are as academics, um, you know, working at um, at different universities, you know, carrying out research, teaching, and and all the other things we have to do. So we are not, um, you know, full-time code developers. Um, you know, we are we're academics who you know have an interest and and have some time to do a little bit of of code development. So that's maybe a, a kind of where GPR Max is perhaps a bit different from some of the other codes that um, and organisations that are that are part of of Summer of Code. Um, but I also think that you know that that makes us exciting as well because you get the opportunity to kind of interact with a code that's kind of pushing the the boundaries of research as well, um, which you know, which I hope is um, is something that that, that may interest you. Um, but I think it's it's important to kind of understand that you know that as mentors we are um, we're academics too, so um, we're not um, as much as we would love to spend a hundred percent of our time working on GPR Max. Unfortunately, um, that's that's not what we can do. So it's just worth saying that. I mean, the, the, the good, the, the up thing from that is that, uh, I mean, we have been supervising many students in many other different aspects uh, in many other kind of things for a long, long time. So I think we'll, we can safely say that we we'll understand supervision and helping on projects a lot more than many other people do. Uh, maybe if we're not really complete experts in all computing techniques. Yeah, I mean, this is our, and in terms of summer of code, where are we? This is our fourth year, I think now. Um, so you know we've probably we've probably had sort of 12 or so something like that um successful uh summer of code contributors um over the past uh four times we've been involved so um we we kind of also understand you know what summer of code is looking for and and how to make sure you know you successfully complete your your project over the over the timeline as well Good. Okay. Well, um, thanks everyone for, for joining and hopefully those that are watching this as the recording find it useful too. Just to answer the last question, yeah, GPR Max is, is definitely more research oriented than production oriented if production means that it's like a code that, you know, like it, it is a research code. Uh, is used in for for is used for for proper research in academia uh, to actually practical research uh, in industry. Uh, so in many kind of levels. Uh, but uh, for us, that our interest on that is because we're trying to push the boundaries of understanding what radar data in the areas that we work. I can tell us from things. And, and a model and a good model really helps in this and it helps other people as well. So, so making the model better, more capable. Uh, there are commercial offerings uh, that what GPR Max does and some commercial offers are doing a lot more than GPR Max does. Uh, if you start looking at the pricing of a per seat license for this, uh, then you are at least in five figures if some of them for six. So we do something which we, we love and we do it for free because we believe on open source. And uh, so that's really, uh, our motivation behind it, but we're going to do it's more research oriented, definitely. Uh, Great, okay. And you know, for those that have joined Slack, then you know, we can pick up any you know, any quick things, quick questions, and things there as well. Um, so that's that's great. All right, hey guys, thanks everyone. Take care, take care, everybody. Have a great day or afternoon, whatever you are. Take care, bye. 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 bye.